So St. John Paul II, you know, great Polish Pope of our day. He, and I tell the story in my book, he probably knew the Catholic faith as well as anyone, I would say, obviously. One day when he was having an audience at a parish in Rome, there where they're allowing questions, and a young girl said to him, Holy Father, are there any aliens? And he could have responded, oh no, that's contrary to the Catholic faith. He could have responded, we don't know. He could have responded, that's something for science to tell us. He could have said, well, if they are then. But his answer was much more simple and straightforward. She said, so are there any aliens? He said, always remember, they are God's children too. And I love that. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Paul Thigpen. Dr. Paul Thigpen is the author of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Catholic Faith. Paul, welcome. Great to be here, Sean. Thanks for the invitation. Okay, so today we're going to talk about, over the ages, how religion has reconciled itself with the notion of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligences and even non-human intelligences. And then in particular, in the event of a disclosure, how some of the religions might cope, react, adapt to that, not necessarily new reality, because as your book kind of states, this is something that has been widely discussed all the way back. So how did it start? And again, my focus is the Catholic tradition and the more broadly Christian tradition. So I don't uh, know a lot about the history of Hinduism, for instance, Islam, Buddhism. So I can't speak for those religious traditions, but my specialization is in the history of Christian thought. And the interesting thing the book shows is that this conversation started 500 years even before the Christian tradition. So the ancient Greek and Roman philosophers talked about it, and they used the term plurality of worlds, which just means having multiple worlds. And for them, world, the word cosmos, we have, that means world, but it also can mean the entire universe. For them, it's the notion that you could have multiple universes. Could you have multiple worlds? Usually with the implication that they would somehow be inhabited by intelligent life as we are. So that started way back. And you had discussions among the atomist philosophers, they were called, mm -hmm. especially who thought that there may even be an infinity of worlds. You have people like Aristotle and Plato, the great Greek philosophers, whose cosmology, whose view of the universe was such that they thought the earth was at the center, and then, you know, moon, stars like that all around the earth. Even though they knew about the planets in the sky, the reason they called them planets is that word means wanderers. And they thought that they too were stars, but they called them wanders because while the rest of the stars went across the sky together, these things were on their own path. So all that to say, they didn't have a concept of rocky bodies that inhabitants could live on. The most speculation they could do is, could there be intelligent life on the moon? So they did talk some about that. So once, especially with Aristotle, once his philosophy kind of won the day, in the West, especially in the influence of the medieval Catholic theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, most folks were just saying, uh, well, you know, we're the only ones because everything centers on the earth and all those other things are just things moving around us. But even then, you had people like Aquinas following Aristotle and saying, but you know, the stars themselves, they may be animated, meaning they may be alive and sentient. They may actually have souls. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? 
tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bane Books at Bane.com. Not the same kind of souls we do, but different souls. And that the souls move the bodies of the stars around. In that regard, you could say that they were open to a, even in that model of the cosmos, open to a notion of extraterrestrial intelligence. It's almost like an argument for consciousness, right? Is there kind of a consciousness embedded in all of reality and stars and animals, et cetera? St. Thomas Aquinas, I don't know what he said about animals, but with stars, it's there are people today who are making similar claims, right? So it's like a cyclic, but it gets more complex over time. Because I noticed in your book, there were certain ideas that would come up, and then they would fade, and they would come up again, and then they would fade, and they would get more intricate. So when you were talking about some of the astronomers, right, when they were able to start to look at these rocky bodies, they were able to introduce the complexity of the density of the different worlds, right, where Saturn's not going to be as dense and therefore can't have organisms or life forms that are similar to humans living on them right but that would be kind of a counter argument and they would just they wouldn't raise the prospect that maybe they're different kind of organisms at least at that stage they would kind of come in and just kind of wave it away completely but it's this ebb and flow the more information that they get the arguments would change but they would also kind of stay the same so so you have kind of St. thomas aquinas then yeah, so I, I want to mention with Aquinas, I don't think he would have said that. I mean, he had a very clear notion of the soul and that, uh, at least on Earth, you have, an, I mean, and the same thing Aristotle would have said, you have animal souls and, and even vegetable souls, but but what that means is that they're alive. There's something other than their body. They're not just chemistry, what we would call chemistry matter. There's something that animates them and makes them alive. But these would be different kinds of souls. So what kind of soul he thought with stars, I don't know. So that's real, you know, that's rather different from the notion of what great consciousness or cosmic consciousness or that the animist notion that stones and trees and things have it. He, you know, he wouldn't have said that. But ju just to clarify about him. But so under Aristotle's influence, then most of the folks up into up until the time of Copernicus were thinking, well, there there can't be other worlds because we're the center of, of everything here. Even then, you had voices like Nicholas Cusa, who was a cardinal in the Catholic Church, held all kinds of positions, who openly questioned that and speculated about intelligent life in other worlds. And it wasn't condemned by the Church. He, he was made a papal advisor, papal legate, to represent someone in the Ecumenical Council of, of Basel, just at the high end, a cardinal. That's as high as you can get in, in a, you know, some regards, mm -hmm. other than the Pope. And so I think it's important to see that, that the church wasn't condemning and saying it's not, no, that's not true. That can't be. They, they recognized him as a, as a very intelligent man. And he was one of the first, even before Copernicus came out, you know, the scientists who came out and said, no, actually, guys, sun's at the middle. We're going around the sun. And even he at the beginning didn't realize that everything else wasn't going around the sun. So you have Cusa coming out and saying that kind of thing even before Copernicus. Then after Copernicus, and then you finally get Galileo where they're showing you these things through the telescopes. It was at that point that Christians and church leaders began to wake up and say, wait a minute, it's not really part of our Christian teaching that we're the center of the universe and that there can't be these other things. That's from a pre-Christian philosopher. You know, Aristotle got a lot of things right, but he got some things wrong too. And so once that they kind of got past that and were able to say, okay, we're not at the center. It's okay to say that. It's okay to look through Galileo's telescope and see that, yes, that Jupiter has moons. And interesting enough, people, a lot of people think that at the time of Galileo, that it was like the church against the scientists. It wasn't the case at all. Galileo's case was kind of special, but there were scientists of the day who refused to believe that what he said was true. The philosophers refused. You know, the theologians refused because everybody accepted Aristotle's system, almost everybody. But then, for instance, when he needed, Galileo needed to get confirmation of of the moons of Jupiter, and he needed somebody who was competent as an astronomer to look through 
telescope and confirm it so he could have some scientific confirmation from other quarters. Guess who did it? It was the Catholic Jesuit astronomers who've been part of the church for a long time. So it's a much more complicated situation. It wasn't just science against religion. It was kind of science against accepted traditions that went all the way back to ancient Greece that they finally had to break out of. Once they did, then you begin to have all kinds of folks saying, okay, well, if that's not the case, and we're not the center of the solar system of the universe, what are some of the possibilities? And my goodness, as you read in the book, all kinds of thoughts. And I don't just look at the Catholic ones in the book. Look at, you know, all kinds of figures uh, from different religious traditions, and as well as statesmen like Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, all of whom believed in extraterrestrial intelligence. So you begin to get that happen. And then by the 19th century, by the 1800s, almost all the theologians were talking about it. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email throughglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. As well as the scientists. And then the scientists got into their debates about, well, you know, now that we believe in Darwin's evolution, then we think it would, there, there's just certain conditions that only happen on Earth. They would almost not at all happen out there. And they're saying, no, no, it's the opposite. It would, if it happened here, then it would happen out there too. So you get that kind of argument. But especially in the 1950s or the beginning of the space age, you had this new group of different Christian theologians talking about it because it was everybody's talking about space. But what began to happen, and anybody in your audience who knows anything about the UFO conversation will know that, you know, starting with Roswell, 47, there was, and this is demonstrated through documents, there was a government effort behind the scenes to make anyone who talked about this seem stupid, need a tinfoil hat, that they would have connections in the media that would help them cooperate in dismissing and making fun of mocking people who tried to report what they knew. And they were largely successful, right? And so by the time my generation comes on, I mean, we're still talking about it some. When I was a kid, that's the 60s. So you had Arnold's thing and you had Project Blue Book. I read about that as a kid. But what had happened, you know, before long was that it was mocked and dismissed in part because of the government's instigation as something serious to talk about. And so you just have theologians of all stripes stop talking about it. They don't want to be part of this thing that now everybody's saying is just dumb. And that's the irony of it. You know, I've said many times, people like myself who love the Christian tradition and love what's been handed on to us and understanding our history, some of the people who feel the strongest that they're traditionalists are, are the most opposed to this because they've been convinced that it's alien to the Christian tradition to even talk about these things. But well, if that's you Thomas really Paine's argument, right? That, that was, that was <laughs> exactly, Paine's yeah, argument. yeah. Paine tried to say that, see, this is real. When it's proved, it will disprove your religion. Right. And, you know, I, that my, one of the points of my book is to be able to show that's not the case at all. We've, you know, Catholic and other Christian theologians have been talking about this for centuries and centuries. It didn't undermine anybody's faith. It just was a possibility that we should talk about and think about. And now in our age, we've actually finally got the kind of communications and instrumentation with sensing devices that we can begin to talk about the possibility that they're here, that they're not just something that could happen in another galaxy, but is there evidence that they're here? Yeah, I mean, they may have been here for thousands of years, for all we know, right? So, okay, let's say there is some form of controlled disclosure over the next 10 years, let's say. How does this manifest itself? Let's start with the Catholic Church, because you're going to be the most informed on that. And then maybe, if you're comfortable, we can speculate on how other religions might adapt or react to it. So when I say adapt or react, first, what would the message be? And then second, would certain doctrines within the Catholic Church have to adapt to new realities as they emerge, right? And I don't know what those new realities are, but it could be something like, this is, this is going to sound co very controversial. I don't have any skin in this game. I'm just making this up. But let's say that we find out that Jesus Christ was an extraterrestrial. I, again, like something that would be fu foundational that would require some sort of uh, 
a retuning or fine tuning of religious doctrine. So two things, communication and then how the Catholic Church specifically might adapt to bombshells like that, if true, mm-hmm. which I have no reason to believe that's true. I, I don't <laughs> <laughs> Let me start with the second one. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, that kind of bombshell, I think most Catholics could say, okay, show me <laughs> show me the data. You know, Jesus was alien. How would you even? Because the truth is, if you've got intelligent races and other planets, and they are visiting here, one of the things I talk about in my book is from the Catholic theology of the notion of of a species being fallen or unfallen, that we are fallen, that we have what we call original sin from the very beginning. We're broken. That means we we lie and we we have mental darkness in different ways and a whole lot of things. But just as if someone on earth walked up to us and said, oh yeah, Jesus was an alien. And we'd say, okay, show me the proof. Even if an alien told me that, I would say, okay, so you got to show me the proof for that. Right. Cause it, in a certain scenario, it would serve a certain type of extraterrestrial to lie about something like that. Of course. Yeah, of course. It would. Right. And we already, people already know, that, you know, the, the Experiences have often said, you know, these things could be deceptive. And, yeah, yeah, they can. So I honestly don't consider that scenario as a possibility, something like that. At this point, I can't consider either. I don't think the possibility that somehow our DNA was manipulated. A lot of people are saying that to create us like we are and that it was done by aliens. Whatever evidence they're finding in DNA and the history of our DNA that would demonstrate that there seems to be at some point a sudden improvement that at least where we are i'd say hey guys we've been talking you know christian's been talking about special creation for two thousand years now but you don't have to have aliens bring them into the notion to explain that if the god the same one who created the universe had a plan to create this race and that's how he did it if that evidence were there but otherwise i'd have to have some really strong evidence for something like that to try to say that aliens even the aliens word for it like i said if they showed up and said oh yeah we did that i'd still have to say okay show me the, show me the data yeah, prove it prove it right. but there are other things and i talked about that in my, my talk at the soul foundation symposium that you've got these fundamentals in the catholic faith and the broader christian faith that for us seemed like not you know would be non-negotiables that okay that there is god He's not just some impersonal consciousness like the Force in Star Wars, but he's actually a person, that he's three persons, a trinity, that he is loving. He's all-powerful. He's self-existent. He's not dependent on anything else. He's infinite. He's eternal. He's unchanging. All those things, that that's kind of a non-negotiable for us. But once you have that, then all kinds of other things can be explained and can be looked into. So you ask the question, okay, if there is this God and he's not some impersonal force that is a part of the cosmos or the cosmos is part of him like a lot of folks seem to want to say these days but if he is real like that then what else might he have created anything else that is is something he's created what might have been his purpose for them how might they be like us how might they be different from us the biggest questions come in with how might an alien race relate to jesus christ so catholic point traditional Christian point, is that once we were fallen, once we were broken, that God loved us enough still to redeem us, to make a way for us to be healed and ultimately to live in friendship with him forever. It's what heaven's about. And so he has done that in Jesus Christ. He became a man. He's done all that. All that. So then the question becomes, if there are races out there, what's their relationship to Jesus Christ? If did what he do here, would it have like a ripple out effect to species in other places? In other words, did Jesus being saved save everybody else out in the universe, for instance? Right, yeah. And or, what is that? Is that sort of, I can butcher it, soterology or something like that? That's the study of that? Soteriology, yeah. It's soteriology. The study of salvation, right. Yeah. Or could it be that God has a different plan for them, that Jesus Christ, who Scripture calls him as the second Adam, meaning he's come for the race of Adam, that he's come for the race of Adam, and that that plan was for us, that all those descended from Adam on earth. And so it doesn't imply necessarily anything about others. You have questions, you know, all kinds of questions that arise in theology, like, okay, if how could our incarnation affect theirs? Are, are God coming here and becoming one of us because they would be so different from us, and they'd never know about it, and all those things. Could it be that you have a race that wasn't fallen? 
that never made the turn away from God that we did, in which case they don't need redemption. They're already living in friendship with God, even in this life. So basically what it, you know, what, what I would say is that, and you've had these conversations again for centuries, is that there's certain things that for Christians would be, I think, non-negotiable that still would allow for a lot of things, you know, aliens showing up and they, they come and they say, oh, yeah, you, you know, if they came, one of the first questions I want to ask would be if we could communicate. How do you think this whole world, this universe we've got, how do you think it, it got to be here? And you could begin to get at the idea of a God if they thought that it was just self-existent. The universe had always been here or whether someone made it or created it or whatever, and to begin to get it at what they think. And maybe it would be a race that's unfallen and they'd say, oh, yeah, a self-existent God is eternal and all those things and say, oh, yeah, we know the same one. Or it could be they said we don't know other kinds of things, but you start a conversation there. But, yeah, I would just never give up the idea that there is a God and that he loves us and that he created us out of love, out of nothing, in love. But let me tell an anecdote. Okay, so St. John Paul II, you know, great Polish pope of our day. He, and I tell the story in my book, he probably knew the Catholic faith as well as anyone, I would say, obviously. One day when he was having an audience at a parish in Rome there where they're allowing questions, and a young girl said to him, Holy Father, are there any aliens? And he could have responded, oh, no, that's contrary to the Catholic faith. He could have responded, we don't know. He could have responded, that's something for science to tell us. He could have said, well, if they are, then. But his answer was much more simple and straightforward. She said, so are there any aliens? He said, always remember, they are God's children, too. And I love that. Yeah, if they're if they're out there, and it sounds like he even thought that they were, they're God's children, too. Now, it doesn't mean that they may not even be hostile to us. I mean, we're all God's children on earth, too, and we have all kinds of enemies and people fighting. But it does mean that he's the one who created them. He loves them, too. He has a purpose for them. And if you believe that, that, that takes a lot of the... I think a lot of the panic and fear out of the whole situation that, okay, yeah, we may end up encountering some race that's fallen that's, or, or more than one race that's fallen that we even end up in warfare with or something. But it's not as if it's so alien that it doesn't even fit into our faith. It's not as if it's so alien that it somehow came into being apart from God. He made them too. Maybe they've turned away from his plan for them the way we have, but he still has a plan. That's a very consoling thing, you know? Well, I noticed in your book, too, that, and this argument was used both ways, that throughout history, the argument of the existence or non-existence of non-human intelligences, and I specifically mean like extraterrestrial life, was its lack of mention in scripture, right? Well, that was one argument. And then, so, you know, on one hand, people would say, well, that's a tacit admission that it's heresy. And others would say, no, they just didn't discuss it. So we're free to discuss it. And then I think others later on would argue that, no, if you read the Old Testament, it actually makes more sense if, <laughs> if you interpret it that way. So a lot of the debate hinged on that and they blended some science. I think you also noted in your book, which I thought was fascinating, that astronomers and physicists of certain time periods more more ready to believe the existence of ETIs, but evolutionary biologists had a lot of difficulty. So, okay, so it sounds like that the Catholic Church is probably in a pretty good position to handle most of the potential ontological shock to its doctrine. How do you think some other religious traditions might handle it. Do you think it'll be similar? Do you think there'll be some that'll be more challenging than others? Hmm. Well, again, I want to make sure I'm not speaking for them, since I'm not one of them, but I will say there's certain varieties of Protestant faith, Protestant Christian faith. I hesitate to use the word fundamentalist. That word has been abused. It came into being as a good thing by Protestants who affirm the fundamentals of the faith. It became a cultural thing, and, you know, so I don't want to just use that term. But there are folks in certain varieties of, of the Protestant tradition that claim that it cannot be, and therefore it's all demons. Often they would say because of the thing about Scripture, but, you know, my response to the Scripture thing is, 
well, scripture doesn't talk about microbes or molecules or right. dinosaurs or dugbill platypi, but we know that they exist. It's not supposed to be an exhaustive textbook of what exists. So some of those folks would have a hard time, and some Catholics kind of under their influence, and I say that strongly, they've had some problems with it. They've woven this whole mythology of not only is this all demons, but it's also part of a false flag operation on the part of folks who want to set up things for the Antichrist. So yeah, if we can make people and, afraid, yeah. make, make people afraid that they are there and that we're under attack, then we'll convince them that we need a one world government and then that'll set things up for the Antichrist. Just to me, it's just a whole modern mythology. It's wild. So you'll have some folks uh, push back there. You know, if I understand correctly, Islam has always been open to this possibility and maybe even affirmed it. I, I do want to talk to a Muslim about that. The Hindus, I think, would have an easy time with it. Yeah. They have a traditional kind of, they meet a new tradition. They say, yeah, come on, you know, <laughs> put your God on the shelf or whatever along with the others. Buddhism, I think. I mean, again, what I know of it, I'm no specialist, would certainly have, have room for it. Uh, the Mormon tradition certainly has talked about things on other planets. So. Well, it sounds like it's a foundational part of it, right? With yeah, Joseph yeah. Smith. Yeah. Yeah. So, tribal religions, I mean, good gracious, you, and by that I mean, the, you know, indigenous religions around the world, they talk about, often about non-human intelligences and different kinds of visiting them, and it's in their art, it's in their legends, it's in their stories, certainly among Native Americans, but others, and so I can't imagine that that, that would be a problem for, for those religions. But again, I can't, you know, I can't speak for them, but I can say that I think if Catholics are willing to go back into the tradition, recover elements of the tradition that have been lost or ignored that show how the boys been open to this. If they will delve more into the the evidence we have for the things that are happening now, stay away from a lot of the kind of, I know there's crazy stuff out there too, but to look at the scientific evidence of the kind they were showing at the symposium, to look at the testimonial evidence of so many, doesn't mean you have to believe every abduction story that you ever read, I'm just saying. Look at the massive stuff and ask yourself, is you know, is it possible really that that's all fake or hallucination or government psyops or whatever? I think we need to widen our imagination some. I said that in my talk that our imagination, you know, helps us to stretch our minds beyond what we already know. And God's creation that he's given us is so mysterious, so complex, so big, so full of realities that we have no clue about yet. If you've got a narrow kind of atrophied imagination, how in the world are you going to deal with that? <laughs> you got to begin to open up your imagination and say, okay, maybe that could be possible. A lot of times folks will just say, well, it's got to be this or that. It can't be anything else. No, actually, right. it could be that, 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 or that, too. You're going to be in so a lot of trouble. that's something we have to you, do. You take we have risk. to remain humble. I tell people, um, go back to the book of Job in the Bible. And Job is complaining to God about all these things, and he doesn't understand why isn't this way, and why isn't God done this way. And God comes back to him and says, "Hey, buddy, you know, we're, I'm paraphrasing. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I threw the stars out there and I established all the ordinances of the heavens?" And Job just says, he falls on his face and says, "I'm so sorry. I, you know, I don't know." I think we have to have that kind of humility that, that God is so much greater than we are. So, in all those ways. Although I think, too, science has a lot to learn from the Christian oh, faith as well. Yeah. And I said that at the talk there, you know, a lot of scientists here, and I thank you for all that science has done to enrich our understanding of the world, universe, and that kind of thing, and maybe it's time to return the favor. Most people, I said in this room, probably are, have found the materialist vision of, of the universe, just matter and energy, have tried it and found it wanting, lacking, and are thinking, okay, there maybe there is stuff out there that science can't measure can't control, can't repeat. So if so, maybe the Christian tradition has something to offer you. All right, I want to take a brief detour because you triggered something, a question I had in the back of my mind. It might be completely irrelevant, and you just tell me, and we don't have to go that. You mentioned something about end times, theology, and things like that. Are you familiar with Hildegard von Bingen mm -hmm. at all? Can you briefly describe, I think she was a saint- I believe canonized saint. Am I correct or am I recently canonized? Yep. Mm -hmm. Recently, yeah. So okay. So some of the visions that she had, 
do you have knowledge of that or what they were or how they related to any of this? Oh boy, that I'd be speaking beyond what I know. I'm familiar with you know some of her life, but I haven't looked at her visions. But is there a particular vision you're thinking about or uh, not not particular? Like I am I I probably know one one millionth what you know, even on this, even if you know very little about it. But okay. I just wanted to raise it and I, I can tell you offline why I'm asking you the question. But it is related to, you know, some of these notions of what some Catholics think in terms of you know, the Catholics that you mentioned about us being ushered into end times and things like that. One of the books I've written is, is called The Rapture Trap, A Catholic Response to End Times Fever. And again, I take the historical approach. That's what a historical mm -hmm. theologian does. And just kind of show how from the earliest times you you get again and again, groups who are just convinced it's the end of the world. Any crisis right there around the corner, all the other stuff, and start kind of gathering together, creating even sometimes communities that sect based on it, even terribly afraid. And they start getting involved politically, then it really gets messy. And in the end, it just always leads to misery. And it doesn't mean that Christ isn't coming back as a Catholic. I affirm that. Jesus Christ is coming back to judge the world. It's in our creeds. But he also said, you know, nobody knows the day and hour. <laughs> and so to try to predict that, and figure all that out, you just get into a lot of trouble. And I see that happening now with these folks who are trying to tie Antichrist end time things into the UAP thing and say it's the great deception described in Scripture. Scripture doesn't talk about anything like this. <laughs> just wanted to mention that. So, you know, I would encourage people, boy, if they're interested in kind of Catholic view of end time stuff, you can read that book. It just takes you again through 2,000 years of history and shows you what the church really does teach, what it doesn't teach. And what it does teach about the end is pretty pretty brief important okay really brief. okay so the next question regards we're going to go back to david grush so he made a claim that in 1944 the vatican reached out to the u.s government to tell them about a craft that had been i think stored in magenta italy and the OSS went and recovered it, et cetera. So I'm just saying that as background. I don't know if the claim is true. We talked about it briefly before. That you don't know if the claim is true, but we both think Grush is highly credible. To your knowledge, what do you think the Vatican knows about? And there's also lots of discussion about what the Vatican knows in Dr. Diana Walls Pasolka's book, American Cosmic, about kind of the, the archives, the vatican observatory all that stuff based on your contacts your knowledge how much do you think or to what extent do you think the vatican is aware of the same things that the u.s government might be aware of with regard to nhi the nhi presence visitation etc on earth i would because of what I have from my contacts, I hate to say that, it sounds like I'm trying to be coy, but I can't reveal my sources. I I think it likely, I won't say definitely, I think it likely that the Vatican knows an awful lot. And by Vatican, you know, that's a big thing. It's a lot of people. Right. But certain folks, anyway, in the Vatican do, that there would be things in the archives that Grush's claims he could have been fed misinformation about that particular case in Italy. But that he seems to have evidence uh, beyond what was made public some time ago when people kind of concluded, well, that's not enough evidence or that's a hoax. He's claiming anyway to have much more stuff than that, than than just what was made public. So I'm not going to say, you know, for sure it is, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if it were. and It wouldn't bother me. I mean, really, it's uh, again, you get people will use this kind of information both ways. There'll be people who say. See, I told you the Catholic Church is, is in on this because they're part of the Antichrist situation or, or set up. And so they're going to make an announcement and it's going to lead right to the Antichrist. And then you got other folks saying, why wouldn't they tell us? This, you know, it's like a betrayal. They won't tell us. I don't know. If it, if it actually happened that way, think about it. It's just, toward the end of World War II, Mussolini's government's fallen apart. You've got probably at some level maybe some of the german nazis still kind of trying to because they were all about this stuff trying to 
maybe would have wanted to get it in spirit away to South America, like they did so many things. You've got the Russians really interested in moving in, to, in different ways. I mean, you've even got the mafia. I mean, think about it. If mm-hmm. if this thing were real and it got around, they could sell it to the highest bidder. And who knows who would have gotten it. If I were the Pope and had information about that, well, it might really seem to be reasonable. Number one, when the world's in such chaos and recovery, it's not the time to talk about it. And number two, who in the present world situation will we most trust to take care of this thing? Certainly not the Soviets. Certainly not the mafia. There's no Italian government to do it. I probably would have made the same decision. But that's all speculative, you know, whether it really happened or not. What about information that goes beyond that, before that? Historical accounts, documents in the archives. There's, I mean, there's a massive complex of the labyrinthine network of like a library beneath the Vatican, right? Like it's miles, miles long. Miles of, sh- miles of shelves, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> think about it. It's, it's the one institution of the world that you know, had representatives throughout most of the world, at least in the last few centuries. If there were something really kind of spooky or anomalous, and you witness it, the first one you're going to talk to about it is your priest. How does this fit in with, you know, what are these things? Priests sending the information kind of up, you know, up the hierarchy. I can imagine that reports like that might have been, even if they weren't intentionally gathered, just made their way eventually to Rome, saying, you know, the, our people are experiencing these things in different places. And making some record of it. And you do have, I mean, we we know about some things like the, was it sometime in the 16th century, I think, in Germany, where the claim was where the, this battle's going on in the air and that kind of thing. If I'm not mistaken, that document's in the Vatican and, you know, I know people have seen it. So that's not something that's hidden. A lot of the stuff they might have from earlier would just be a matter of how do you interpret it? Do you think well, it's isn't there, a, do you think there, it? I think there's a story that you were relating on a different interview about the encounter St. Anthony had in the desert, and then I think something about St. Jerome mm-hmm. verifying it. So again, it's all hearsay to some extent, but you say a little bit more of that and that. And I think there also, there was a Roman emperor, according to St. Jerome, that saw a body at Antioch of one of these entities. Like, what's that story? Yeah. Again, we don't yeah, know the if story it's is, real. Okay. Right. And f- first of all, even apart from that, and it's not in the book because I only learned it later, I wish I had known it in his great book, The City of God, St. Augustine, actually at one point references satyrs, the Greek mythological mm-hmm. creatures, and speaks as, an, as if he thinks they're they're real. And so you have a similar thing with St. Jerome, who is his contemporary. St. Jerome is interested in writing the life of St. Paul, but not Paul the Apostle, a, a Paul of Northern Africa in the desert, one of the desert fathers. And so he tells this story in a letter about St. Anthony's going to visit St. Paul. And he encountered first a centaur, the German mythological figure, and then a satyr. And he actually has an ongoing conversation with a satyr, well, short. And the satyr makes this, you know, interesting. He says, well, what are you? <laughs> you know? And he says, I'm one of those creatures that um, the Greeks, meaning the Gentiles and non-Christians, mistakenly worship. But he has the appearance of a satyr. And I'm here to talk to you about this, that we've heard that you, that you Christians have been given this information about essentially about Jesus Christ. And after the incident's over, then you could say, okay, well, Jerome was just repeating what he heard, or that he didn't really believe it, or he's just, you know, whatever. But then Jerome goes on to say, and for those of you who don't think these things are real, you know, we actually, you know, some time ago, and I, I checked out from other references, the time period would have been about the time probably when he was around, he was born or a child, that, yeah, one of these creatures was actually captured alive and then seen by hundreds of people and then it died so they preserved the body in salt so they could bring it to i was thinking it was alexandria rather than antioch but maybe i'm wrong i have to go back and look where they brought it you know brought the thing there but and yeah i could be wrong i could be wrong right yeah but anyway just the main point is and i'll say in the book that is a proof that those things are real from his or from saint augustine or from an exorcist talking about similar kinds of things in the 1700s that we might think of as poltergeist but what it does demonstrate to people who say, no, this is contrary to the Catholic faith, that some of the best formed you know, people in the, in the Christian faith and the Catholic faith, whether it's St. Jerome or St. Augustine, or whether it's 
say, John Paul II, or whether I have a story in there too from an account from Padre Pio, a famous kind of Italian Catholic saint, that, you know, they knew the faith as well as anyone, and they thought it was either possible or actual. And Padre Pio mm-hmm. said, yeah, there are others out there, and they haven't fallen. They serve God better than we do. So if nothing else, it demonstrates that, uh, you know, I'm not just some kind of maverick all of a sudden saying, oh, this stuff is, could be real. The church can make room for it. People have made room for it. Well, well, you know, thinking Catholics for a long, long time. All right. The first question, how right. did the Catholic Church disclose, let's say, the American government? Or, I mean, we could have a complete wild card, the Chinese government. Let's say the Chinese government comes out and discloses. <laughs> how would the Catholic Church handle that? Well, that's really hard to say. A lot would depend on who the Pope was at the time. Everything would depend on who the Pope was at the time. Let's say the current. Let's say the current Pope, just to be. Oh man, I don't know. I don't know how to predict <laughs> what, Francis, what Francis would do. I understand from my sources that he has, at least in the past, had an intense interest in UFOs. That would be interesting if it's true. I'm not going to claim it's true. I don't have it firsthand, of course. So much would depend on the Pope. So much would depend on how it's disclosed by whatever source i think they probably would want to wait until some secular government begins to disclose and then to say yes we affirm we've known about that beyond that would they have some of the vatican jesuit scientists you know astronomers start talking about it would they i'd hope they say hey this thick thin guy wrote a great book about it why don't you read it (laughs) they don't know my book from anybody but and just if you know, if you know Vatican, the Vatican way of doing things and the Roman way of doing things, it's usually very slow mm-hmm. and very careful, and very calculated. You might have people at high levels saying, giving press conferences, say, "Oh yeah, I know that all along. Let me tell you all about it." But I, I doubt it. It would be quite reserved, I would think, and more yeah, of an affirmation imagine. of what's already been revealed. Yeah, because yeah, you could go too far if you are effusive about it it's gonna be like well you've been you know have you been lying to us well no we haven't we haven't you know you can look at that pope john the second quote right i mean he literally affirmed it he didn't say if there were life he out didn't there, say there was not say, i mean it sounds like they, an are, all they yeah, are all they god's children they are all god's children yeah, yeah. so it's not like the catholic church has been lying about it or demonizing oh, never, people yeah. about it I mean, officially, the church has never taken a position on it. It's still open. Yeah. Yeah. So to your point, like they've been pretty calculated and thoughtful (laughs) about it. To the same extent of, you know, not front running some of the secular powers around the world and coming out. Whereas the U.S. government is, you know, one could argue has been, you know, has harassed people, has destroyed lives and things like that, and has outright lied to the public about it. So there is that piece about the catholic church that is in its pocket right it's never lied about which is you know kind of a catholic thing to do right not lie right <laughs> so <laughs> and we have to so, understand there's you know there's a tradition in the catholic church too that that you're not supposed to lie but in certain circumstances you can not give all the information <laughs> that it's legitimate to if the information is not to use the technical term due to the person that's asking for it. classic example would be okay Nazi occupation of Holland, but one of the other countries that come in door to door and saying you're hiding, are you hiding Jews? Are you hiding Jews? That you would be able, you can't outright lie about it, but you'd be able to make a comment that would not give enough of the truth, or even where people might misinterpret it the other way and just leave it to them. So you might be able to say something like, "Are you crazy? Do you think I would threaten my family's safety and welfare by doing that? Go down the street, look for somebody else." They haven't lied. But the, they did not owe that information to the Nazis. It could be that in some ways they say, we don't owe that information to the world right now. Not yet. Now, maybe people would argue with them over that, but they're certainly not lying. That's different from lying to saying, you know, we have nothing to say about that. All right, Dr. Thigpen, Paul, I keep, I'm going to keep calling you doctor if you don't correct me. You got to correct me. <laughs> I appreciate your time. This is a fascinating discussion, and I look forward to speaking with you in the next episode. You too. Thank you, buddy. God bless you. Thanks for having me. 
If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe, and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.